I have to ask you, um, can you summarize your argument against the hypothesis that we live in a simulation? Is it sim similar to our discussion about uh, the doomsday clock? Um, no, it's actually pretty more similar to my um, agnosticism about life in the universe. And it's just sort of remaining agnostic about all possibilities. Um, the simulation argument, sometimes it gets um, it mixed. There's kind of two distinct things that we need to consider. One is the probability that we live in so-called base reality, that we're not living in a simulated reality itself. And another probability we need to consider is the probability that that technology is viable, possible, and something we will ultimately choose to one day do. Mm -hmm. and those are two distinct things. They're probably quite similar numbers to each other, but they are distinct probabilities. So in my, in my paper I, I, I wrote about this, I just try to work through the problem. I teach astrophysics, actually teaching it this morning. And so it just seemed like a fun case study of working through a Bayesian calculation for it. Um, Bayesian calculations work on conditionals. And so when you hear, you know, what kind of inspired this project was when I heard Musk said was like a, a billion to one chance that we don't live in a simulation. Mm -hmm. um, he's right if you add the Bayesian conditional and the basic conditional is conditioned upon the fact that we eventually develop that technology and choose to use it, or it's, it's, it's chosen to be used by such species, by such civilizations. That's the conditional. And you have to add that in because that conditional isn't guaranteed. And so um, in a Bayesian framework, you can kind of make that explicit. You see mathematically explicitly that's a conditional in your equation. And the the opposite side of the coin is basically um, in the trilemma that Bostrom originally put forward, it's options one and two. Mm -hmm. So option one is that you basically never develop the ability to do that. Option two is you never choose to execute that. Mm -hmm. So we kind of group those together as sort of the, uh, the non-simulation uh, scenario, let's call it. And so you've got non-simulation scenario and simulation scenario. And agnostically, we really have to give though, you know, how do you assess the model, the a priori model probability of those two scenarios? Um, it's very difficult and we can, I think people would probably argue about how you as assign those priors. In the paper, we just assigned 50-50. We just said, we this hasn't been demonstrated yet. Mm -hmm. There's no evidence that this um, is actually technically possible, but nor is it that it's not technically possible. So we're just gonna assign 50-50 probability to these two hypotheses. And then in, in the hypothesis where you have a simulated reality, you have a base reality set at the top. So there is, even in the simulated hypothesis, there's a probability you still live in base reality. And then there's a whole myriad of universes beneath that, which are all simulated. Um, and so you have, a you have a very slim probability of being in base reality, if this is true. Mm -hmm. And you have a 100% probability of living in base reality, on the other hand, if it's not true and we never develop that ability or choose never to use it. And so then you apply this technique called Bayesian model averaging, which is where you propagate the uncertainty of your two models to get out a final estimate. And because of that one base reality that lives in the simulated scenario, you end up counting this up and getting that it always has to be less than 50%. So the probability you live in, this, in, in a simulated reality versus base reality has to be slightly less than 50%. Mm -hmm. um, now that really comes down to that statement of giving it 50-50 odds mm -hmm. to begin with. And on the one hand, you might say, look, David, I'm, you know, I work in artificial intelligence. I'm very confident that this is going to happen, just of extrapolating off current trends. Or on the other hand, a statistician would say, um, you're giving way too much uh, weight to the simulation hypothesis because it's an intrinsically highly complicated model. Mm -hmm. You have a whole hierarchy of realities within realities within realities. It's like the inception style thing, right? Mm -hmm. And so this requires hundreds, thousands, millions of parameterizations to describe. And by Occam's razor, we would always normally penalize inherently complicated models as being disfavored. So I think you could argue I'm being too generous or too kind with that, but I sort of want to develop the, the rigorous mathematical tools to explore it. Mm -hmm. And ultimately it's up to you to decide what you think that 50-50 odds should be. But you can use my formula to plug in whatever you want and get the answer. And I use 50-50. So, and, but when in that first pile, uh, with, with the first two parts of the, 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 the Bostrom talks about, it seems like connected to that is the question we've been talking about, which is the number of times at bat you get, which is the number of intelligent civilizations that are out there that can uh, build such simulations. Mm -hmm. That's, it seems like 
very closely connected because if we're the only ones that are here and it could build such things that changes things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this, yeah, the simulation hypothesis has all sorts of implications like that. Um, I've always loved, Sean Carroll points out a really interesting contradiction apparently with the simulation hypothesis that I speak about a little bit in the paper. But he showed that, um, or, or pointed out that in this hierarchy of realities, which then develop their own AIs within the realities, and then they, or, or really ancestor simulations, I should say, rather than AI, they develop their own capability to simulate realities. You get this hierarchy. And so eventually there'll be a bottom layer, um, which I often call the sewer of reality. <laughs> it's like the worst layer where it's the most pixelated it could possibly be, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, because each layer is necessarily going to have less computational power than the layer above it. Because mm -hmm. not only are you simulating that entire planet, but also some of that's being used for the, the computers themselves that those are simulated. And so that base reality, or sorry, the, the sewer of reality, is a, is, a, is a reality where they are simply unable to produce ancestor simulations because the fidelity of the simulation is not sufficient. And so from their point of view, it might not be obvious that the universe is pixelated, but they would just never be able to manifest that capability. What if they're constantly simulating, because uh, in order to uh, uh, appreciate the limits of the fidelity, you have to have an observer. What if they're all, always simulating a dumber and dumber observer? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> what if the sewer has very <laughs> dumb observers that can't, like scientists that are the dumbest possible scientists. <laughs> so like it's it's very pixelated, but the scientists are too dumb to to even see the the pixelations. Right. So like that that's like built into the universe always has to be a limitation on the cognitive capabilities of the complex systems that are within it. Yeah. So that sewer of reality, they would still presumably be able to have a, a very impressive computational capabilities. They'd probably sure. be able to simulate galactic formation or this kind of impressive stuff, but they would be just short of the ability to, however you define it, create a truly sentient conscious experience in a computer. That would just be just beyond their capabilities. And so uh, Carol pointed out that if you add up all the, you know, you count up how many realities there should be, probabilistically, if this is true, over here, the simulation, uh, hypothesis or scenario, then you're most likely to find yourself in the sewer because there's just far more of them than there are of any of the higher levels. Oh. And so that sort of sets up a contradiction because then you live in a reality which is inherently incapable of ever producing ancestor simulations. But the premise of the entire argument is yeah. that ancestor simulations are possible. So there's 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 a contradiction. That's you know, been there's that there's that old quote: "We're all living in the sewer, but some of us are looking up at the stars." Uh, maybe. <laughs> this, this is maybe more true than we think. <laughs> uh, but to me, so there's of course physics and computational uh, fascinating questions here. But to me, there's a practical psychological question, which is, you know, how do you create a virtual reality world that um, is as compelling and not necessarily even as realistic, but almost as realistic, but as compelling or more compelling than physical reality. Because mm. something tells me it's not it's not very difficult in the in the in the full history of human civilization. That that is an interesting kind of simulation to me because that feels like it's doable in the next hundred years, creating a world where we're all prefer to live in the digital world mm. and not like a visit but like yeah. it's like you're seen as insane no like you're required it's unsafe to live outside of the virtual world and uh it's interesting to me from an engineering perspective how to build that because i'm somebody that sort of loves video games and it seems like you can create incredible worlds there mm. and stay there and uh, that's a it's a different question than creating a ultra high resolution, high fidelity simulation of physics. But if that world inside a video game is as consistent as the physics of our reality, then you can have your own scientists in that world that trying to understand th that physics mm -hmm. world. It might look different. But and presumably they'd eventually forget. You know, give it give it long enough, they might forget about their origins of being once biological and assume this was their only reality. Especially um, if you're now born, you know, uh, well, certainly if you're born, but even if, 
you were eight years old or something when you first started wearing the yeah. headset. <laughs> yeah, or you have a memory wipe when you go in. I mean, it, it also kind of maybe speaks to this issue of like Neuralink and how do we keep up with AI in our world. If you want to augment your intelligence, um, perhaps one way of competing, and the, one of your impetuses for going into this digital reality would be to be competitive intellectually with um, artificial intelligences, that you could trivially augment your reality if your brain was itself artificial. But I mean, one one skepticism I've always had about that is is whether, it's a more of a philosophical question, but how much is that really you if you do a mind upload? Is this just a duplicate of your memories that thinks it's you versus truly a transference of your conscious stream into that reality? And I think when you, uh, you, it's almost like the teleportation device in Star Trek. Um, but with teleportation, quantum teleportation, you can kind of rigorously show that, um, that uh, you know, all as long as all of the quantum numbers are exactly duplicated as you transfer over, it truly is from the universe's perspective um, in every way indistinguishable from what was there before. It really is in principle you and all the sense of being you versus creating a, a duplicate clone and uploading memories uh, to that human body or a computer that would surely be uh, a, a discontinuation of that conscious experience by virtue of the fact you've multiplied it. And so I, I would be hesitant about uploading for that reason. I would see it mostly as my own killing myself and having some um, AI duplicate of me that persists in this world, but is not truly my experience. Typical 20th century human <laughs> with, a, with an attachment to this particular singular instantiation of brain and body how silly humans used to be. Used to have rotary phones and um, <laughs> and and other silly things.